In the year uh, 2002, Barnes & Noble uh, published a book that if you walk into Barnes & Noble and you look at the discounted books, you know, they have a section where you don't pay full fare for the books. You will find this book in all likelihood. At least it's been there before. It was written by Miranda Twiss. And the title of it is something like this, The Most Evil Men and Women in History. The Most Evil Men and Women in History. I'd like to read you just a table of contents. Caligula, Nero, Attila the Hun, King John, Torquemada, Prince Vlad Dracula, Francisco Pizarro. My name is Pizarek, not Pizarro. I'm not part of his family, thankfully. Bloody Mary. Ivan the Terrible, Elizabeth, Countess Bathory, Rasputin, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, Ilse Koch, Pol Pot, and Idi Amin. Those are the ones that this particular uh, book covers. Of course, he mentioned, he failed to mention, the author failed to mention about a million others who were just as evil. Last week uh, in the mail, I got this from Michael Evans. He loves the Jewish people. And uh, this was a mailing, and it was entitled, Six Million Jews Died in the Holocaust. Six million who died in the Holocaust. Evil. Evil. Evil people with evil intentions. And uh, I think that two of the greatest questions of history are the following. Why is there evil in the first place? And secondly, why is evil not punished? Why is evil, and let me insert a word here, seemingly not punished. I'd like to deal with tonight, if I may, something that is uh, probably close to your heart. You, you just don't feel like expressing it sometime. And perhaps the thing that bothers us the most is that people get away with stuff. Somebody knifed you in the back and twisted the blade and walked off without any consequences or accountability. Now, it may not bother you like it bothers me, but it really bugs me. It really does. How comes so-and-so gets away with all this stuff? They can do anything they want to and nobody touches them. Seemingly. If you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalms, I'm, um, I, have, um, I have to honestly confess to you, I have an addiction. I do have an addiction. I, I'm addicted to the book of Psalms. So I love my addiction. I, I'm addicted to the book of Psalms. I have a hard time getting out of it. Look at Psalm 97 for just a moment, for just a minute. Psalm 97, the Lord reigns, and it appears to many that he doesn't. Where is God? The first statement, opening statement, Psalm 97, God is in charge. He rules and reigns. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles or islands be glad. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice 
Notice justice. And what we're dealing here tonight with is injustice. Righteousness, that which is right, and justice are the foundation, the very foundation of his throne. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. Did you know that God has a lot of enemies? And you know what God is going to do to them? Well, tonight we're going to find out. Yeah. And then if you'll just uh, skip over a few verses and look carefully at verse 8. Zion hears and is glad. And the daughters of Judah rejoice. Why? Because of your judgments, O Lord. Folks, if there is no accountability... If there is no coming judgment, if there is going to be no divine retribution, that means revenge from God, if there is none of that going to be, then it begs the question of God's justice. Is God just or isn't he? Is he or isn't he? It begs the question of Christ's death. Why did Jesus die on the cross if sin is inconsequential? If people are going to go to heaven anyway, or if it doesn't matter how you live your life, right? Why bother? And that's, that leads us to the third question. Yeah, hey, I can live any way I want to. I can do anything I want to do. I can kill, I can rob, I can maim, I can do anything. I can punch somebody's lights out. Why? Because supposedly, there are no consequences. You can do as you wish. And don't worry about anything. Really? It begs those questions. So, uh, tonight I would like to deal with ultimate justice and retribution. Because the very God who is the God of love is at the very same time a God who demands what is right. And he's just. He is just. And he will not wink at sin and evil. He's not going to do it. And just because God doesn't take care of it this very minute doesn't mean that he won't take care of it later. That's an illogical assumption that, okay, nothing happens. So-and-so got away with it. Hey, what's the use? In your... Uh, outline here, I, let me just tell you what I did. I, I spent a lot of hours on this because it bothered me. And it should bother you that there's evil and it's not being dealt with. Now, this moment, necessarily. Sometimes God deals with it immediately. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? Sometimes God waits to deal with it in the end at the great white throne judgment, Revelation chapter 20. So here's a four-part outline. Here's what I'm dealing with that I'd like to share with you. I think it's important. In the first section, it's renderers. Who is going to be or who are going to be the ones who will execute justice? There are three that I find mentioned in Scripture. First of all, the sovereign God of the universe. Secondly, the Savior, because all judgment has been committed to him. And thirdly, believe it or not, the saints, born-again believers. Right. So these are its renderers, and I'm going to come back to this in just a moment. I'm just giving you a little preview, if I, if I may, and then we'll come back to do a little, fill in a few more details. The second section, it's regulations. What are the principles? What are the regulations about this justice? There is a principle of sowing and reaping. 
there is a principle of surety, and I'll, I'll mention to you what that surety means momentarily. The third section has to do with its repayment. There is going to be a repayment. And God is going to repay Eva in two ways. First of all, in suffering. And thirdly, in sentencing eternally those who are evildoers. Folks, there is no way, there is no way under the sun that we can murder 58 million babies and God is going to wink and say, oh, but they were only fetuses. Oh, they really were not babies. They were born, but conception is not important. Birth is, conception isn't. So up until the time that they are born, they're just nothings, if you please. And after that, today, according to today's standard, after that, you can even kill babies after that. Just don't call them human beings. And don't call it murder. Call it a woman's choice. Question, choice to do what? Hitler, do you really think that after all he did, he's going to get away with it? Really? Stalin murdered millions of people, many more than Hitler did. And that's okay? I don't think so. I don't think so. There's going to be a repayment someday. Suffering and final sentencing. And then the last section of this page, and again, we're just going to touch a few points, and that's all the time we'll have tonight. The recipients. Who are those who will be on the receiving end of God's justice? On the receiving end of God's justice. I just looked at a few of these. Here are some of the words that are used. The wicked. Entire nations. Entire nations. That are going to be punished. For example, Saudi Arabia. That execute on the average one person every other day. Transgressors in Psalms. Kings. You think kings are going to get away with it? If they were evil? Don't for a minute think so. Heads of groups, heads of departments, heads of states, peoples, entire people groups, nobles, who were not so noble, by the way, unfaithful people. The world is going to be judged, the entire world. Angels are going to be judged, wicked angels. Troublers, unbelievers, the Antichrist, the devil, the dead, and then some miscellaneous names and people and evil actions. Revelation chapter 21. So I would like to deal with that tonight because it, it really begs the question tonight. Evil is happening all over. It's being exacerbated. You know what that means? It's a big fat word. It just means it's getting much worse, much more intense, much more evil, much more dark outside. And we wonder, when is it going to stop? What is God going to do about this? Will he forever let it go? And by the way, as you read these portions of scripture, what you begin to find out is that God says at one time, no more. It will culminate in his justice and his judgments. 
And if you want to avoid this whole issue of God's judgment and leave it to the place where God is simply a God of mushy, gushy love, syrup all over, it doesn't work that way in the Bible. It doesn't work that way. If you're going to talk about the love of God, you better define what you mean by God's love. For God so loved the world that he did what? He sacrificed. That was painful, folks. That cost God his most precious, priceless son. There was no mush and gush involved in that, I can tell you that much. It was a straightforward deal. Christ shed his blood for our sins. So the first uh, section here deals with the renderers. Who are they who are going to be rendering justice? The first one is the sovereign God. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 32, you will find a very familiar verse. And it is repeated in Romans 12 and Hebrews 10. So it's rather important, I would say. It's repeated several times. And it is God's word, even if it were only mentioned once. Deuteronomy 32, verse 35, reads something like this. God is speaking. Vengeance is mine. And recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand. It's coming, in other words. They're going to get it. And the things to come hasten upon them. If you were to look at the New Testament references, it would go something like this. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. What are the next three words? I will repay. I will repay. It's coming. It's just a matter of time. God is going to do it. Now notice, not only the sovereign God is going to do it, but when you come to John chapter 5, verse 22, we read there that God, the Father, has committed all justice to his Son. So God, the Father, says, yes, I am just, I will execute vengeance, but I'll do it through my Son. That's what he says. Notice carefully in John chapter 5. And if you'll turn there in your Bibles for just a moment, <coughs> we need to look at several verses. John chapter 5, and notice carefully verse 22. For the Father judges no one. God says, vengeance is mine. But now he says, he judges no one, but has committed all judgment to whom? To the Son. So God is going to be the judge of the earth, but he's going to do it through his son. Verse 27, and has given him, his son, authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Jesus says, I am going to be the ultimate judge of the earth. Someday every knee is going to bow to him whom they hate the most. The battles in this universe today, in this whole world, is a battle against Jesus Christ and his word. That's the battle. I just got a Saturday's paper, Valley News, and the front page. There's a battle that's going on now for the, the, the high school here with the Ten Commandments. You know, that there, somebody, some cheeseheads came down from... Uh, uh, I think it was uh, a couple of years ago out of Wisconsin, and they didn't like that they saw the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are what you will find, or what you would find, in the Ark of the Covenant. You see, the Ark of the Covenant is the very epicenter of this universe where God has inscribed his moral law. Psalm 2 says, the kings of the earth and the judges and everybody, they're trying to get rid of their constraints, their restraints. They're trying to get rid of them. 
They're trying to get rid of the Ten Commandments. Why? They don't want God to tell them how to live. They want Jesus Christ out of their lives. And God says, that's only going to last so long. Then you're going to bow. And then you will be sentenced to an eternal lake of fire. You can laugh. You can mock. You can scoff at it. But I will tell you something. It's going to happen. You can bank on it. It's going to happen. So the Savior is involved. And if you'll turn to Revelation chapter 14 for just a moment, this is about the mid uh, point of the tribulation, the mid trib, middle of the tribulation on the earth, time that's coming just around the corner. Revelation 14:10. Anyone worships the beast and his image, that's the Antichrist in verse 9. He himself also shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Whoa! Don't you dare worship that beast. And it's coming. It's coming. And finally, believe it or not, the saints are going to be part of the judgmental system. They are going to be judges. You don't believe that? Well, let's begin with 1 Corinthians chapter 6 for just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And what happened in uh, the church at Corinth is that there were believers taking other believers to court. They, they were suing them in simple language. And we begin with verse 1. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know, Paul writes, that the saints... Now, folks, the saints in the New Testament are not people who were pretty nice and good during their life. And 500 years later, the church, the Roman Catholic Church says, Hey, these people were pretty good people. We're going to make saints out of them. I don't need any church to tell me that I'm a saint. I'm a saint because Jesus says, the Bible says, I'm a saint. Now, I'm, I fail sometimes, but I'm a saint. It's written in the, I'm written in the Lamb's book of life. I'm a saint. And if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are a saint. Now, the saints, verse 2, will judge the world. Didn't you know that? You. And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Now notice verse 3. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Uh, in the context, my own uh, belief is that these are evil angels, not good angels. Because the world is evil. And so in, in a parallel structure here, I think the angels here are also evil. Christians are going to join, are going to judge the world and angels. That's right. You as a believer and I, under the headship of Jesus Christ, will judge the world and angels. While I was studying this one time, uh, several months ago, uh, as I mentioned to you, I was having devotions in the Psalms. I've been in the Psalms for a long time. And by the way, as a believer in these last days, you should soak your head in the scriptures. You know that, don't you? You should soak your head in the Bible. You should. Yeah. If you turn to almost the last psalm, Psalm 149, I came across these verses. And I said to myself, you know what? Perhaps Psalm 149 is prophetic in nature. Perhaps it has reference to the day of judgment at the great white throne. Look at these words. I couldn't believe my eyes. How could I have missed it all these years? And suddenly, there it is. It's been there all along by divine inspiration. Look carefully. Verse 5. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Where? In glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Now, why is that? 
Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. We just sang the high praises of God earlier. And a two-edged sword in their hand. Wow. What does that signify? Verse 7. To do what? To execute vengeance on the nations. Did you see that? Who's going to do that? Verse 5. Let the saints be joyful. To execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all his saints. Did you understand what the psalmist is saying? Someday, the saints, the believers in God's word, are going to have the prerogative of executing vengeance. Folks, there is a real problem if we don't believe in God's justice. There is a huge problem. And for, for the last 30 years or so, we've had an evangelism that simply says, God loves you. Let me mush and gush over you. All syrup. And we fail to tell people that if they don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that there is going to be condemnation. God is just. He has a standard of right and wrong. Some things in the world are absolutely wrong. And who says what's right and wrong? I would like to suggest to you that God says what's right and wrong. God says so. So these are the renderers. God the Father, God the Son, and the saints. They're all involved in God's justice system. Second section is the principles, the regulations, if you please. There is a, a, a law engraved in the very fiber of this universe. You can't get rid of it. It's there and it applies to every person who's ever lived. It's, it's, it's inscribed into the very fabric of this universe. It's found in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. What goes around, we might say, comes around. If you dig a pit for somebody else, you're going to fall into it. That's what it says in Psalm 7. And Proverbs and some other passages. But I'd like to remind you of a man by the name of Haman in the book of Esther. You see, what the guy does, he hates the Jews. By the way, Genesis 12 verse 3 says, If you bless the Jew, God will bless you. If you curse the Jew, God will curse you. Haman is a case in point. Haman, Hitler, I'm not so sure I like the H, the letter H, but I guess it happens. Haman decides to build gallows, 50 cubits. Now, if you know, if you want to know how much 50 cubits is, the, the Jews would, men, you know, measure the cubit from the tip of the uh, elbow here to the top of your finger, and on the average, typically, it would be about 18 inches, foot and a half. So if you multiply 50 cubits by a foot and a half, the gallows were 75 foot up in the air. I wonder if there was good visibility at 75 foot. And those gallows were meant for Mordecai, the Jew that Haman hated despise so much. As the story unfolds, the next thing you know, Haman is destined to hang on the very gallows that he made for Mordecai. And so it is inscribed in the eternal book 
we call the Bible. And so it's going to be. There is going to be a day of retribution. And the law here is the law of sowing and reaping. What you sow is what you're going to reap. And nobody is exempt. Kings are not exempt. Nobles are not exempt. People in high quarters and low quarters and in betweens, nobody is exempt. All the way from Adam and Eve to the last humanoid or human being in this world. Nobody gets away with anything. There's one group of people whose judgment has been paid. It's dealt with. When Jesus died on that cross and shed his blood on that cross, he took my judgment upon himself. And therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's right. That's right. I don't have to fear God's judgment. It's not that it was removed and nothing happened. It's just that Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Jesus paid my judgment. He took it upon himself on that cross. So there's the principle of sowing and reaping. Then there's the principle of surety. Now I wish we had the time to develop this, but read Psalm 37 and Psalm 73. And what this principle simply says is that you can be assured, you can be sure that it's going to happen, that God is going to execute vengeance. You can count on it. The psalmist he, he, he's puzzled in Psalm 73. He's puzzled. How come these people get away with all of that? They are rich. They are famous. They have money. They have health. They have everything that, and they don't even think about judgment because in their vocabulary, that word doesn't even exist. Happy lives tormenting others. And the psalmist says something like this. Until I went into the house of the Lord, then did I understand their end. Until you read the scriptures, then all of a sudden you begin to realize, hey, there is accountability. Somebody's going to pay. Somebody's going to pay. So if you think so-and-so got away with it, you better rethink that again, because nobody gets away with anything. Nobody. Nobody. I think we need this counter emphasis, this balance. Do we have a loving God? The answer is certainly we do. Do we have a merciful God? Absolutely we do. And I'm glad for his mercy, because if it wasn't for his mercy, we'd all be consumed. But we also have to look at the same God as he is revealed in scripture as a God of justice. If it wasn't for his justice, we could all live like devils. If there was no accountability, you could live any way you want to and you wouldn't have to worry about a thing. But because he's just, you better worry. Unless you know Christ as your savior because you're not condemned Jesus was in your stead cursed is he who hangs on a tree let's look at its repayment now time and again uh, let's turn to Psalm 37 for example I mean this is very very rich it's it's a blessing to read Psalm 37 Verse 38, but the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. It's another name for they're going to die. By the way, death in the Bible never means annihilation. 
It never means poof and you're out. You're no longer there. I, I sat with one of my relatives uh, at the dinner table many years ago. And, and as I was talking to him, uh, we were talking about the future, what happens in the afterlife. He said to me these words, when I die, that's the end of me. My response to him was, wishful thinking, my friend. Wishful thinking. Because what it does, annihilation avoids accountability. In other words, I can live any way I want to. And then when I die, poof, I'm gone. Notice in verse 38, but the transgressors shall be destroyed. Never annihilation, always separation. Death in the Bible is always separation from God. And if you're separated from God, you say, oh, well, I can live my life. I'll have fun. I'll have a couple of Budweiser's down with my buddies in hell. Really? In the lake of fire? where it is dark, where you're being punished forever and ever, without any hope of God, without ever being released? And you're going to talk like that? You really want to gamble on that, do you? You want to take the risk? I don't think so. Psalm 73. Now, if these psalms are easy to remember. Take the opposite of 37, you have 73. So let's go to 73 for a minute. Verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places, you cast them down to destruction. I think the world needs to sit up and take notice that God is giving notice. Perhaps final notice. You better believe in the saving grace of Jesus Christ and be saved before it's too late. Once you're out of here, folks, your destiny is sealed. It says so throughout Scripture. So there's suffering, and then there's also sentencing. If you'll turn to Second Thessalonians, I mean, we could pick any of these passages tonight. There are just numerous passages. I have been very selective here. Um, you could add a, a, a ton of other passages, if you please. But let's just look at one briefly. Sentencing. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Since it is a righteous thing, it is the right thing. Righteousness in the Bible simply means what is right. In a non-theological sense, it is simply what God says is right. It's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Well, who are those that trouble you? Well, obviously, it's people who don't believe in the same God you do. They wouldn't act this way otherwise. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming fire. I mean, these are sobering words. Taking vengeance on those who do not know God. And on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The good news. You didn't want God's good news. Now there's bad news for you. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Away from. Away from him. No more hope. You know why I believe in evangelism? Because I want to give people hope. I want to say to them, turn around before it's too late. Because when it's too late, and I don't determine that, God determines that. When he says it's too late, it's too late. Folks, I, I, I'm like pastor. The two of us, are, I think we're cut from the same cloth. But we do a lot of reading of the news, what's going on in the world. 
And I want to tell you something. I'm reading a lot about stuff that's going to happen in the month of September. I mean beginning with Tuesday throughout the end of the month. September, September, September. Somebody's expecting something. I think God in his grace is still saying to us, come unto me and I will save you. But don't wait too long. You may not have it tomorrow. You may not have it. Suffering and sentencing, and finally, the recipients. See, there aren't that many Christians in the world. If you look at religious textbooks, books about religion in America and religions of the world, what you will find is, at least several years ago, that these secular textbooks say that Christianity is the most populous religion of the world with two billion approximately. The Muslim religion right now is about 1.6 billion. But Christianity, there are two billion supposedly. Well, that would include Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Catholics, Christian scientists, Scientologists, yeah, it's a mishmash. Religions of all kinds, Catholicism, uh, you name it. Everything gets thrown, lumped into this you know, umbrella called so-called Christianity. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, Few are those who enter through the narrow gate. Genuinely born again, Born from above, believers are few in number. Just because we say we're a Christian nation, just because we call ourselves Christians, and are nominally so by name only, doesn't mean we're really Christians. I think Christians are few and far. In between. You know where many of the real Christians live? They live in Nigeria. They live in China. Some perhaps in North Korea. In countries where they are paying a steep price for their faith, like the Middle East. Except for Israel, which is a very safe haven for many religions. There they are not, for most part, persecuted for what they believe. And as you look at this list here, it is actually a breathtaking list. Look at all the many that are going to be recipients of God's wrath. And he is storing up wrath against wrath. In other words... I think what that means is that God is going to pay back with interest. You better not mess with Jesus Christ. You better not mess with him because you're going to lose. History bears it out. You never, never go against Jesus Christ because you'll never win. He will be the final judge of the earth. I'd like to go to one final passage, if I may, uh, tonight. It's found in John's Gospel, the Gospel of John. Gospel, by the way, means good news, good news. John chapter 12, and I, I look at this as the bottom line in apologetics. This is the bottom line in the defense of our faith. People say to you, well, I'm a JW, I, I'm a Mormon, I'm a this, I'm a that. Or I'm an atheist. That's that the, the latest greatest. I'm an I'm an atheist. You know, or I'm a nun. Now I'm, let me spell the word nun for you, so you don't think I'm talking about Catholicism. It's not N U N, a female Catholic ad, advocate. I, it, it's uh, or devotee. It, it's N O N E. 
And that's a, a huge rising group, especially of the 20 and 30-somethings, who don't want to be affiliated with any kind of religion whatsoever. They don't want to be tainted. Now, you would better know this as secularism. Secularism. So whoever comes to you, here's the final word. This is the final word. This is the bottom line. John twelve forty eight. And I have it marked, well marked in my Bible and in my memory. And you ought to have it well marked. So you can re return to it over and over again. Use the scriptures in your witnessing, in your testimony. The power, by the way, is in the word. Not in your word, but in God's word. The word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So the power resides in the word, in the word of God. Now look at verse 48, John 12, 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words. By the way, you cannot separate Jesus from his words or his words from Jesus. You cannot say, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe his word. Or you cannot say, I believe the word of God, but I don't believe in Jesus. See, they're inseparable. They're one and the same. Was it, one is the inscribed word, the inspired word. The other one is the incarnate word. And they are in perfect harmony. They never contradict. So Jesus says, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which what? Judges him. And what is it that's going to judge him? The word that I have spoken, Jesus says, will judge him in the last day period. It will judge him in the last day. Tonight you may say, well, I wish I hadn't come tonight because I was hoping for something like uh, Joel Osteen, something a little more positive. Why did we have to hear such a sour message? God is angry. God is just couldn't you have said something about the love of God? Couldn't you have talked about syrup? Because that's what people understand under the love of God. No, I couldn't do that. I would not be true to the word of God if I didn't tell you that God is also a God who says there are things that are right, things that are wrong. You say, well, isn't God forgiving? Well, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Yes, he is a forgiving God. Well, somebody stabbed you in the back and you say, well, I'm, I, I, I forgive and I forget. Well, it, my personal computer up here says you can't forget. I don't forget. God doesn't forget. If you said God forgets, then he would not be omniscient. And he is omniscient. He's all-knowing. Forgiving does not equal forgetting, folks. One of the New Testament words for forgiveness is to remit, to let go. When God says he forgives our sins as we confess them to him he lets go of them he doesn't bring it up again against me it's been dealt with at the cross of Jesus Christ but he doesn't forget forgiving does not equal forgetting I've been forgiven I've been forgiven but God remembers his son on the cross who took away my penalty that I deserved. He took it away. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. He did. So we have to be very careful how we understand scripture. God is a God of justice. He will recompense. He said, so I will repay if you think for one minute that Hitler
is going to get away with what he did, you better think twice. If you think world leaders are going to get away with torturing and murdering Christians and Jews all over the world, you better think twice. Nobody gets away with anything. Why? Because it's in the very inherent nature of God to do what is right. And when God says this is right and that's wrong, he really means it. And just because he doesn't deal with it today doesn't mean he won't deal with it tomorrow. He will. So tonight, I know some of you, I'm blessed to have you as my friends. I don't know all of you, and mostly, I don't know your hearts. God does. And that's what counts. I know some of you are born again Christians with a great testimony for Jesus Christ. I know that. You've given evidence of it time and again. Could be somebody's here without Christ tonight. I don't know. I would like to give you an invitation. After we pray, after pastor concludes, stay back and say, you know what? God has spoken to my heart through the word of God. I want everlasting life. I want the grace of God to be shown to me. I want God's mercy. I repent of my sin. I want to be born again because God wants it in my life. And we will be happy. Pastor will be more than happy. That's why he's here. That's why I'm here. And perhaps that's why you're here, to show somebody the grace of God so they can.